Uh, chairpersons, madam, ladies and gentlemen, I am the last batsman, and uh, you must be all tired and uh, you know waiting for the dinner. So I will try to be uh, short and fast. And of course, thanks to Professor Ranjan for the kind invitation. I've been uh, coming to this uh, stroke symposium for now a lot many years, and uh, he somehow gives always a tricky topic to me. Uh, uh, so, uh, the topic is that should secondary stroke prevention include NOAX in addition to antithrombotics? Now, I should slightly modify it in one way that should secondary stroke prevention include NOAX in addition to antiplatelets by defining that. So, obviously the question comes that, you know, that the patient is already uh, receiving antiplatelets and then should we add NOAX in that patient for certain reasons? And obviously the reasons would be that, as you know, that the NOAX are prescribed for the you know, non-valvular atrial fibrillation primarily. Of course, there are other indications. So the question is that whether such a patient would benefit or not. Certainly, we would like to give because we all know that the cardioembolic risks are very high in such patients, and we would like to give NOAX. But if we change it the other way around, should the secondary stroke prevention include antiplatelets in addition to NOAX? Like the patient who is already having a non-valvular atrial fibrillation and is on NOAX. And then the certain situations in which uh, we might contemplate adding antiplatelets to its uh, treatment regimen, should that should be the basic topic of discussion today. So first I'll set up context uh, because there are certain, you know, I see very, every time by experience, I know there are a lot of youngsters here. So I'll make it very simple and basic. So, you know, in secondary prevention, there are two aspects. One is antiplatelets and one is anticoagulants. And as you know that for the non-cardioembolic strokes, we have the antiplatelet therapy. It can be given as a single agent and it can also be given as a dual agent under certain circumstances. And for the uh, cardioembolic strokes, we have the anticoagulants, which include the VKs and the NOACs. So this much is the basic knowledge we all know. And in the context of the today's topic, that basically what we are looking at is the non-valvular atrial fibrillation group, because that is the group that is likely to get the NOACs for the treatment. Okay. So... There is a known data set on AF and stroke. We all know that about 2% population of younger than 65 years and about 9% people aged more than 65 years in the United States have atrial fibrillation. Presence of atrial fibrillation increases the stroke risk by five-fold. So it's an enormous risk. It's a very huge risk. Warfarin remains the only approved medication for valvular atrial fibrillation. Concurrent aspirin and warfarin used with INR targets of 2.5 to 3.5 is recommended for patients with mechanical heart valves, while warfarin alone with INR target of 2 to 3 is used for most of the other patients of AF. And NOACs are now increasingly being used for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Now let us come to the antiplatelets. Let us see that what is this current guideline, the, uh, which is published in 2018, recommends. Now, we have the, still the aspirin as the gold standard. Aspirin is recommended in patients of uh, ischemic stroke, acute ischemic stroke, within 24 to 48 hours. It is not recommended as a substitute of IV alteplase. And in patients presenting with minor stroke, as has been alluded previous, in previous talks, that the treatment for 21 days with dual antiplatelet therapy, and usually the aspirin and clopidogrel, begun within 24 hours, can be beneficial for early secondary stroke prevention for a period of to 90 days from symptom onset. So this is a new addition. And so therefore, minor strokes, you need to add aspirin and clopidogrel and give it for a certain period of time, and then you followed by aspirin alone. And the rest of the other antithrombotics have really not taken a uh, good place, and they are not recommended because of either a bad uh, results or that there's not enough studies available to prove their efficacy. Now, I see a lot of patients also coming now, uh, still that people receive, you know, from outside, you know, peripheral centers coming to us with having had received anticoagulation. But to emphasize this fact, 
that urgent anticoagulation is not recommended in AIS. And usefulness of urgent anticoagulation in patients with severe stenosis of an internal carotid artery, ipsilateral to an ischemic stroke, is also not established. Often we see this, that there is a thrombus, and people start anticoagulating. It is not established. It is to be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. And therefore, the anticoagulation, in short, has no place in the acute management of AIS. Recently, in the last couple of years, there has been some studies, anecdotal uh, reports of utility of combining the NOAX with Altiplace to improve the outcome. But again, the safety and efficacy data are not good enough and there are no randomized trials available and therefore still it is in the rudimentary state and at the moment cannot be prescribed. Now going for the anticoagulants in AF, we have to go back to 2014 AHA criteria in which it has been said that it has to be a shared decision-making process between the patient and the doctor. You cannot just blindly start the anticoagulation therapy in all the patients. Of course, you have to assess the risk of anticoagulation. And the scale, the most commonly used nowadays is the CHAD uh, VAS score. And that is the recommended, although it has got its own limitations, but I'll come to that uh, later. But the patients with a non-valvular ape with a prior stroke a trans or transient ischemic attack or a CHAD score of two or greater, oral anticoagulation are recommended. Options include the warfarin, dabigatran, uh, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. For patients with non-valvular AF unable to maintain a therapeutic INR level with warfarin, and that is around 30 to 40 percent of the overall control level, if it is not maintaining that, then there is also a case in which you can start the NOAX. So this is the summary, and this is more or less been followed in the 2014 Again, a summary of uh, AHA for the secondary prevention of stroke. And this is basically comes from this, you know, trials. As you all know, that there are uh, quite a few pivotal trials so that rely on Rocket AF, Aristotle, and Engage, which has shown that, that if you see the use of uh, NOAX compared to warfarin, they are faring either slightly better or if not inferior to warfarin. And on the other side, in the terms of major bleeding, they are actually better, although some of the agents may have a more chances of gastrointestinal bleeding compared to warfarin. But by and large, this safety profile with the use of administration, with no, no, util, uh, no uh, necessity of uh, measuring the INR, actually has propelled this entire segment up and the for last decade or so, it is going in a upslope, the usage of NOAX in non-valvular AF. But you have to remember that anticoagulation is always a balance, and there has been no head-to-head -head study between these agents. But if you see the, the, the incidence of the strokes or the systemic embolization effects and the major bleeding effects, these are faring differently, differentially. So therefore, in a given patient, what will happen? And how this patient is going to be going to fare is difficult to predict from because of the lack of any head-to-head -head study when you choose a particular NOAC. So in 2016, the European Cardiological Society's guideline recommends that when oral anticoagulation is initiated in a patient of AF who is eligible for a NOAC, a NOAC is recommended in preference to vitamin K antagonist. Whereas American Association still says that they are comparable, either of them can be used. But here, for the first time, we are getting this idea that this is probably a preferable agent. Antiplatelet monotherapy is not recommended. And the, obviously, the NOACs are not recommended for the patients with the mechanical heart valves and with the AF. And if you see, go back to, again, the 2018 guidelines, then you will see that there is a small you know, segment where they are talking about this, but in a very cursory manner. They say that for most of the patients of acute ischemic stroke in the setting of atrial fibrillation, it is reasonable to initiate oral anticoagulation within 4 to 14 days after the onset of the neurological symptoms. Patients with a history of ischemic stroke, atrial fibrillation, and coronary artery disease, the usefulness of adding antiplatelet therapy 
to oral anticoagulants is uncertain. So they are not sure because they, they say that the large studies are not available because it is not proven that they actually reduce the risk of ischemic cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. Unstable angina and coronary artery state stenting represent special circumstances in which the management may warrant a dual antiplatelet or oral anticoagulation. So it's a little vague in this scenario that they have left it quite open-ended. So let us see why have they done so and what is the implication of this. Now you know that there, are, there may be a lot of clinical setting, there will be a lot of overlapping indications for anticoagulation and antiplatelets. For example, a non-valvular AF patients who had had a stroke may also have a coronary artery disease. A venous thrombemolic patient may also have a stroke, may also have a coronary artery disease. And a systemic embolization patient, like a pulmonary embolism patient, may also have a coronary artery disease because atherosclerosis is a generalized process. It's a polyvascular disease that we are treating. Maybe that the patient has come to you with a stroke, to the cardiologist he has come with a myocardial infarction, to a peripheral uh, artery specialist has come with a PAD, but all these changes are there. Some of them are overtly symptomatic and some are latent and hidden. So the treatment has to be individualized. So let us talk about this only, that the non-valvular atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease and stroke. Now in patients of non-valvular atrial fibrillation, so-called earlier term the lone atrial fibrillation who doesn't have any other associated features, there has been that it is already documented that they have a very high risk of stroke, as I said. They also have a high rate of CAD. In fact, as, as many as 20% of them will eventually develop a CAD within three years of the detection of their uh, atrial fibrillation. They, these patients who are having a CAD, either latent or overt, may also present an acute coronary syndrome like unstable angina or myocardial infarction. And higher proportion of these patients may actually require a percutaneous intervention in the form of stenting. And overall, if you see this group, then there are higher rates of mortality. So therefore, people argue that is it not better that when these patients only are only on anticoagulation, let us also add on the antiplatelets. And in fact, as you know, the cardiologist always add in a patient who are having a cardiological symptom, always add clopidogrel in their scheme of things. So there are three concerns for, you know, looking at this rationale. That first, that whether this kind of rationale is going to reduce the stroke risk, whether this rationale is going to increase the bleeding risk, and whether because of this, the thrombosis of the stent or the acute coronary syndrome related mortality in the form of MI or unstable angina will actually be decreased. So the, for the stroke risk, the parameter which you use clinically is, as you know, that the score which I've said, which is basically a nine point score. And it is, as you see that as we go up in the score, the annualized stroke rate increases potentially. From 1.3% in the score one, it goes to about 15.2% in the score nine. Now the patient cohort which was used to develop this score was prescribed antiplatelet ducts in about 75% of cases. And so it provides a reasonable, you know, uh, scale to measure the stroke risk in these type of patients. On the other hand, the bleeding risk has been calculated by this Hasblet score. And again, we have got nine sp uh, point score depending on these parameters like hypertension and uh, abnormal liver function, stroke, bleeding, labile INR. But here, unlike the previous one, only 7.1% of the cohort used to develop the Hasblet score were Crow-prescribed an antiplatelet and anti oral anticoagulant. Although subsequent investigations have shown that it, with the moderate accuracy, it predicts the rate of the bleeding, the risk of the bleeding. So although we have these two tests, these two scales to predict, but they are, there are limitations which we should understand. So the clinical question is that what happens to the stroke risk all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, or coronary revascularization risk, which is in cardiological terms, they label it as a MACE, bleeding risk, and stent thrombosis risk in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation with coronary artery disease when intervened by one, two, or three drugs. So if you see the trials that were happening, 
that these can be conveniently grouped into three groups. One before 2010 trials and 2011 to 2014 and after 2014 trials. So initially to start with, as early as in 2006, the Sportif 3 and 4 trials, had, they did a meta-analysis on, on that. And this showed that there was no significant difference in MI risk between those receiving the warfarin alone versus warfarin plus aspirin. Whereas there was a significant increase in the major bleeding rate, which was uh, more in the warfarin aspirin group, 3.9% compared to those receiving warfarin alone, which was 2.3%. Then there was another study came a year later, data from 10 randomized controlled trials, again showing the same thing, that the risk of major bleeding was higher in those receiving the combined antiplatelet anticoagulant therapy. It was not unexpected, it was expected, but it's just that the, the meta-analysis actually showed which was expected, and the odds ratio was 1.43, that is about one and a half times more you have the risk if you combine the oral anticoagulants and aspirin. This very, very, you know, quoted study, the observational Danish registry study involving about more than a lakh population, surviving the first hospitalization for AF noted an increased risk of fatal and non-fatal bleeds, receiving aspirin plus warfarin compared to OAC alone, and again the hazard ratio was 1.83. So all these studies, even in that early area, era, actually were showing that there were increased chances risk when we are combining with an oral anticoagulant and aspirin. Of course, the oral anticoagulant at that time was warfarin most of the times. There was again another nationwide Danish administrative registry with a cohort of about 8,000 plus patients. We showed that the risk of the myocardial infarction and the thromboembolism was similar, that they were not gaining in that reducing the risk, but the risk of bleeding was significantly higher when both these agents were combined. Again, the hazard ratio. And you can see that it is clustering around 1.5 times in a, around that figure. Then there was this coroner study in which about 4,000 people, people were with a stable CAD, free from any MI or coronary revascularization for more than one year at the inclusion. And the patients of AF were a small subgroup, about 7.2%. And slightly more than 11% of the cohort was receiving treatment with both antiplatelets and oral agents. And here again, the risk of bleeding was much more, about 7.3-fold than compared to the single anticoagulant arm. But these were all observational studies. Another important study which came as an orbit AF study, the outcome registry for better informed treatment of atrial fibrillation, it explored the role of concomitant aspirin therapy in patients of AF who were already receiving the OAC, oral anticoagulants. And they found the major bleeding, the adjusted hazard ratio was again 1.53, and, and in, in the com combination group as compared to the OAC alone group. So all these observational studies were actually showing this. Then came this study that, which is, it was basically a study what is the optimal antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy in patients with oral anticoagulation and coronary stenting, the WASTE trial. Patients who were receiving the chronic oral anticoagulation who also had a severe coronary artery disease and had an indication of a percutaneous intervention. Because now there is an intervention arm there that was included, and the results at one year showed that a lower incidence of bleeding in the combined treatment group, that are OAC plus clopidogrel, compared to the triple therapy group when OAC plus clopidogrel and ASA were combined. So this is the first time in a control trial, the double dr dr drug regimen and the triple drug regimen, they were compared and they showed obviously that there is a increased with the three, when you compare, uh, increase the three drugs. But in this cases, they found that between the two groups, the other secondary endpoints of death, MI, stroke, target vessel revascularization and stent thrombosis was similar between the two groups. So therefore, people took it from there and thought that maybe that, you know, we may actually enlarge on this and start seeing that what is the effect. And in fact, that effect continued, and this is a publication from the Scandinavian countries in 2018, and you see that over the years, despite this potential likelihood of increased bleeding, the use of the NOAC plus aspirin plus clopidogrel, there's a blue dotted line that you can see that that has increased in both the groups, both in the patients with a PCI. Okay, so this is the this is the line as you can see that is shown a 
up, upward trend. And here also this, this, this was shown by 2016, actually this was surpassing all other combinations. So the triple drug therapy has been used in a much, much wider scale, although there was not definitive in, uh, evidence for its efficacy. Now going back to the NOAC trials, even if you see the Aristotle, the RELY or the ENGAGE trial, in all these trials there were a subsection of population which were receiving both aspirin and the NOACs and in all of them actually the bleeding risk was more. So therefore the question came that there are two important things that need to be identified and it is basically driven by the cardiologists that because they see from their point of view the acute coronary syndrome and the intervention, the stenting, these are the two important things which need to be clarified in, in the context of giving an oral anticoagulant and addition of antiplatelets in these patients. So therefore, this in 2013, there is a systematic review and the meta-analysis of the seven studies published so far. They have shown that there is a 15, only modest 15% risk reduction of the cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. But if you add to a more number of drugs, including a single or dual antiplatelet therapy after an acute coronary syndrome, your risk of bleeding actually becomes three times more. So that was a concern. Interestingly, in the same journal, there was an editorial, and uh, it is written that is three a crowd? And the author actually, you know, uh, analyzes this, but says that, okay, the benefits are modest, but if you see the stent thrombosis rates, the, actually this combination helps in reduction of the, th the stent thrombosis rates. So you see the, you know, concerns are different. We neurologists are more concerned with the breed in the brain and overall bleeding and mortality, but cardiologists are more concerned about the stent thrombosis and the acute coronary syndromes which may result. So going from 2000, this was in 2013, and in five years down the line, they could gather many studies, in fact 14 of them, in which they have studied the efficacy and safety of triple therapy versus dual anti plated therapy in patients of atrial fibrillation undergoing coronary stenting. And this meta-analysis has shown, the 14 studies are there, and this, in the, if you, among them, the 11 studies actually showed that ischemic stroke rate is reduced. 26% reduction in the ischemic stroke as compared to the, with, the, with the triple therapy compared to the dual therapy. If you see the rate of stent thrombosis, the six studies measured that, there was a 60% reduction in the triple therapy group versus the dual therapy group. And if you see the rate of major bleeding, there were 14 studies in which, again, they showed that there is 1.55-fold increased risk of increased bleeding in the triple therapy group versus the dual therapy group. So what they actually said, the very interestingly, the authors, in the first two measures, they find the studies were more and more homogeneous, you know. So homogeneity was good. But in the last, the, in the side effect, uh, you know, the bleeding parameter, the studies were inhomogeneous. So therefore, they said that probably that triple therapy is still better than the dual therapy. And of course, the, uh, the MACE and all-cause mortality and MI did not differ between the groups. And these are the forest plots. As you can see in the first, the stent thrombosis, clearly the diamond favors the triple therapy, whereas in the MACE it is, it is in between in the center, whereas in all-cause mortality again it is in the center, but on the bleeding side the diamond moves to the dual antiplatelet therapy group. Just, I have just two, three slides. So people now have started looking at that what are the other finer points actually, it's not the double or triple therapy as such, that what are the finer points in, in, in you know, deciding. So first, the type of the strengths. Now, newer generation, the drug eluting strengths are preferable over the bare metal strengths. That is one. The older generations like Sirolimus and Pacitexel, they are gone. They should not be used. The newer gener generation anti-platelet uh, agent should not be used in these patients. And if NOACs are used, then they should not be changed with a VK, VK agents. And if the VK agents are used, 
in combination with a single or dual antiplatelet therapy, INR should be controlled between 2 to 2.5 and not between 2.5 to 3.5. So, from this, the European Cardiologic Association Society has given this paradigm that if the bleeding risk is low, then you start the triple therapy, you give it for six months, followed by a dual therapy for another six months, and then lifelong monotherapy with anticoagulants. If the bleeding risk is high, then you give the triple therapy for only one month, then dual therapy for the next 11 months, and then you continue for the monotherapy for lifelong. And this is for the MI or the uh, acute coronary syndrome patients. And for PCI, that you should give triple therapy. If the bleeding is low or high, you give the triple therapy for one month for both the groups. But for the dual therapy, there is a change. If the bleeding risk is low, you give it for 12 months. Or if the bleeding risk is high, you give only for three months. And then you continue with the monotherapy. We don't know about the still the direct relationship between these trials and these four trials are on their way. The Pioneer AFPCI, Entrust AFPCI, then the Dual PCI and the Augustus trial. And these will probably shed more lights on the utility, efficacy and safety of combining the NOACs with antiplatelets. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Devashish, uh, there is a lot of uh, scarcity of time.